a warm, warm welcome to all of you who have made time to be here, despite the serious after effects of the pandemic, which is really online fatigue. So we're extremely excited to engage with you over the next hour and some in this first dialogue session, where we, along with our panelists, hope to inspire you to come and play with technology and art for the climate crisis. My name is Kamya Ramachandran. I am the founder director of Be Fantastic. And on behalf of my co-founder Archana Prasad and the, the amazing Be Fantastic team, I would like to thank some special organizations and the people behind them who've had the foresight to nurture and support our vision. Some of our partners are old and long-standing partners. Some of them are new, and we're really happy to have these amazing relationships. So the US Embassy in Singapore, Swiss Arts Council, Pro Helvetia, New Delhi, India, Goethe Institute, Max Muller Bhavan, Bangalore, India, and supporting this dialogue series is the Embassy of Switzerland in Singapore. We're also deeply, deeply grateful to some amazing partners who've come aboard, um, ThoughtWorks Arts in the US, In the Wild and Supernormal in Singapore, Dara Network also in the US. So thank you all for really coming together. The reason we named this Be Fantastic Together is like, we have, there've just been so many people who've jumped aboard this adventure and we're really hoping that more of you in the room do the same. So we can move on to the next one. Be Fantastic as an idea and an organization emerged around six years ago from the strong conviction that when the world of art and technology come together, some amazing things are brought to bear. So in our first tech art festival in public space, attended by close to a thousand people in Bangalore's main MG road. Uh, I think back at this one particular piece that we presented amidst, I think 40 odd tech art experiences. This one also supported by Pro Helvetia no New Delhi, supported Christina Della Guistina, a Swiss uh, artist, tech artist who collaborated with Vasundara Das and Saith Chandrasekhar from India to put together this evening experience. And what it really was is it brought together Christina's technology where her, her premise was that we don't feel data. There is so much data outside and it's just such an abstract number driven thing. We really don't feel data. So she created a set of algorithms that pull in data, push it in through the algorithm and create soundscapes like this. Um, soundscapes that help us feel an, an, an emotion towards our data. Overlaid onto this technology layer was Masundara Das's really poetic voice and Sai Chandrasekhar's percussion magic. And there you had a, a group of audience that was really like taking in this new format. Now the data that was fed to these artists to render into an emotional soundscape was water data from Bangalore, groundwater data from Bangalore over the last 10 years, collected by researchers from the Indian Institute of Science and the Stockholm Environment Institute in the US. So really like quality of water, quantity of water, depletion of the groundwater, things like that translated into an artistic experience for us to feel the gravity of the crisis that we are in. So I just wanted to pull this together to showcase one of the ways, one of the many ways in which technology and art can come together to amplify a message. Um, and these are really the things that we hope the fellowship will continue to do. The agenda for today, we have the magic of technology and art, 
uh, rendered by Ong Kiang Pen, who's our Be Fantastic mentor from Singapore. Talking about tech art and climate, we have Andrew McWilliams from ThoughtWorks Arts USA, who's also a mentor on Be Fantastic Together. I will present to you how we imagine this version of the fellowship. And we have Ambika Joshi, Nayeli Varga, and Thomas Heitman, uh, a group of fellows collaborating in our previous fellowship. And they did some really amazing work that they developed as a prototype in the fellowship, but went on to, to develop independently beyond the fellowship and present it in Berlin. So that would kind of really give you a sense of how things can play out if you came on board and had fun with us. So yeah, without, so I think I will hand it on to Kian Peng now, who is the founder of Supernormal in Singapore. He's also an educator, creative technologist, and Kian Peng, tell us more. Hi, <laughs> let's, let's skip this photo. So my name is um, Kian Peng, and I'm a media artist and curator. <clears throat> and I'm also running this independent art space called Supernormal. Can we go to the next one? Yeah. And it is an independent art space that is focused on uh, emerging artists also on uh, uh, focus on digital and new media art. And the aim of starting this space was really to fill a gap um, where previously in Singapore, there wasn't so much of a, a media art landscape. And very often I feel like um, people working with art and technology is kind of marginalized. Uh, and of course that has changed in the last couple of years. So um, we have seen a, a rapid adoption of technology in the arts in recent years. So I personally have been working with art and technology for about uh, 12 years now, starting from my days in uh, LaSalle College of the Arts and going on to do my master's degree in UCLA. And my practice uh, spans across multiple um, medium and formats uh, and which includes creative coding, uh, video, sound, kinetic devices, and 3D animation. And I'm going to show some examples really quickly. Can we go on to the next one? So the first project, yeah, it is Flat Helmet. And it is a variable device that visualizes predicted sea level rise in the future. So much of my work centers or revolves around this idea of climate change, uh, nature and ecology as well. And the next work, can we move on to the next one? Yeah, um, this work is called Too Far Too Near and it is an audio visual installation that addresses the notion that, you know, climate change is something far away and something really intangible and that which will not affect us personally, um, especially here in Singapore. So, the work really tries to provide a way for uh, participants or viewers to try to connect to what is far away and a kind of a meditative platform for that to happen. And can we go to the next one? So this particular work is called Centrifuge and it is a kinetic sound uh, installation that explores um, sound from a physical perspective. So in this work, I'm using purely analog uh, technology and just playing with how sound can have a, a, we have a VR experience that is titled Fragmented Dreams. So this work looks at um, this idea of the sublime, which is traditionally, traditionally a, a concept, a philosophical concept or aesthetic concept that addresses uh, climate change and nature. And in this work, we look at this idea of beauty versus danger. And we try to reconcile this idea of climate change with between these two very opposing uh, terms. The next one. And the final work is called Rescue Operations, which is a media installation that explores um, the absurd and uh, absurd things that happens or surrounds this idea of climate change. 
And the inspiration of the work uh, stems from a lot of the um, things that you would think is easy or that should already happen, but it's not happening. When we look at or think about how we can address climate change, it is a really complex issue. And sometimes we face a lot of um, resistance and the work really plays wrong with this idea of the absurd. And this work makes use of um, machine learning algorithms or machine learning models to generate uh, text and narrations, uh, which sometimes seems to be quite logical and sensible. And at times it, it is completely nonsensical. So it plays between this fine line between the real and the fake. Um, and using that as a starting point, we, we attempt to question what is real or what is, what is not. And finally, you know, we, uh, sorry, the next slide. We look at this idea of art and technology. So this idea of art and technology is not new. You know, it's, it has actually been around for a long time. Uh, artists have used technology as part of their work as far back as the Renaissance period, where, you know, artists have been using tools or technology to help them in the creation of the artwork. But the real difference is the idea that technology becomes the medium. And this has its roots uh, in the early art and technology movements or the electronic arts or cyber arts between the 1960s, 1960s to 90s. And moving on to, to, you know, to the contemporary period, we are really looking at this fusion you know, between technology and our daily lives. And we have some really exciting developments. So one of the focus in this program is uh, artificial intelligence. And mostly what we are looking at is this idea of machine learning or this technique of machine learning, where we look at how computer algorithms can be trained to do certain things. Uh, can we move back to this previous slide? Yeah. And, and the idea really comes with the idea of training based on data sets and using that as a kind of like a filter uh, to train algorithms where we have input going through to the model and finally having some kind of output. And one of the most accessible ways of looking at what this can do is uh, the work by Mario Klinchman. Can we go on to the next slide? So Mario Klinchman is, is an artist who works between the intersections of art and technology. And he's famous for working with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to generate uh, portraits. So in this series of work uh, called Memories of Passerbys, he takes a data set of uh, paintings from between uh, the last two, 300 years, uh, portraits of famous uh, figures and using them as data sets to train the algorithm to produce endless versions of portraits. And what's interesting about this is that the portraits have this really bizarre quality to it. And I think what's really exciting about works like this is that we don't really know what might come about from these uh, algorithms. Can we go on to the next one? Yeah, so he takes paintings that uh, have been done by famous artists, for example, collections from Google data sets and passes them into the algorithm and uses them as the basis or basically to teach the computer how a face looks like and then teaching the computer to draw that out, to draw new versions of it. Can we go on to the next one? So the next work is uh, the logical by Random International. And this is a work that looks at the idea of um, organic flying uh, swarms. So very much like a flock of birds. Each of these um, floating spheres or balloon, if you want to call that, has a kind of a, its own mind. You know, it takes into account of human presence and the change of the environment and reacts accordingly to that. So it, it decides on its own what to do when someone, say, runs across the space 
or if someone is spinning nonstop in the space. So this is an endless uh, iteration of movements. And this is unlike what we might do with just normal algorithms, because it kind of decides what to do by its own based on data set. Can we go on to the next slide? Yeah, so in this work, there's something really interesting with the interaction between the participants and the work itself. So that's really the beauty of work, uh, which is quite different from the previous work where we have a visual output. Here we have interactions. And, and this is a very different way of looking at what algorithms or machine learning or artificial intelligence can do. And finally, we have the work by Jessica In called Nora. And this is a really interesting work that looks at collaborative play. And in this work, the participant will draw something and the machine will interpret that drawing based on uh, you know, a data set of objects and animals and living things. So you will try to identify, okay, what did this person draw? And it will collaborate um, by drawing another drawing, another version of that. So this is kind of like the exquisite corpse that, that were um, invented by the surrealist in the 19, uh, early 1900s, uh, where you have a drawing and someone else continues that drawing. So it does this collaboratively between uh, the participants and the computer. And what's really amazing about this is that the, the final result is, is really organic and you almost can't tell that it is drawn by a machine. Can we move on to the next one? So here, the computer actually learns what is being drawn first. So let's say someone draws a kangaroo and it decides that, okay, this person is you know, drawing a kangaroo and it can instantly, or, you know, it, it is trained to draw multiple versions of the kangaroo. So every time you would draw something different, but you can still recognize that, hey, this is a kangaroo or this is a pizza. And, and that's really the kind of um, magic about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, where the computer is trained to sort of imagine, it is trained to be creative somehow. And, and this is essentially what uh, a lot of the developments of machine learning and artificial, artificial intelligence in the art is about. So I will now pass on to uh, Andy, who's going to talk to us about climate. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Thank you, Kian Peng. Yeah, Andy, take it away. Sure. Um, Andy or Andrew's fine. You know. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Andrew. <laughs> no, no, no. I was Hello, confused. But, and, Andrew, quick <laughs> introduction. <laughs> uh, quick introduction of Andrew. Uh, he's the founder of ThoughtWorks Arts uh, from the US, is also the founder of climateaction.tech. So we're really, really happy to engage with him. Uh, he's helping us also develop the program in addition to being a mentor and a fabulous partner. So Andy, tell us more. Thanks, Kamya. Um, yeah, thanks, Ken Peng. It was really interesting to see those examples of the work, especially if perhaps people on the screencast haven't seen um, as much algorithmic work. And so what I'm going to do is kind of step back a little and look at some of the what goes into the production around work and especially how community affects that and how community supports um, people of different skill sets to come together, which is really what we're trying to do here with this program. Um, so if you go to the first slide, please, I want to begin here. These are pictures from 2011. Um, I was at Jaga in Bangalore, which is where I met Archana Prasad, who now runs Be Fantastic alongside Kamya. Um, so this is 10 years ago, uh, and it's the place where I did my first residency, my first arts residency. Um, I had been in tech for a while before that and I was getting very interested in art. So here you can see pictures and images of people working at Jaga, each in their own subunits dotted around the around this, this building um, in Bangalore, but all together. 
And one of the key things that about Jaga that I love so much, um, and this really set me on a new path in many ways, was that people were working on the, all their own projects, but they were all part of a community. And it's a very supportive community. It was a very international community. It was a very interdisciplinary community. It was a very permissive and open and multi-issue community. And I saw that people could come together from all these different backgrounds and produce way more by being part of a community. The space itself, you can see, was intentionally very makeshift and refigurable, um, but that made a great environment to focus on the coming together of people and projects and ideas and for community members to support each other in an ad hoc way. And so it's very powerful. And so that's what we're trying to do with this program, but now we're trying to do it online, you know, with a wider, wider and wider groups of people. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. The next set of images here are from Jaga also, but this is from the exhibition that we were working on. The residency led to the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition was called Sound and Lights. And this is also the first time I had my work included in an exhibition. On the bottom left there, you can see flowers. They're by Agnesi Mosconi. Um, those open and close um, in the light. And you can see these other electric, electrical works. And mine on top left there is um, a projection mapped sound and visual installation. And it really plays with the idea of negative space. Those are, those are like six foot tall, eight foot tall panels that you see there, all three of those in a triptych. So that was a real experience uh, being at Jaga, working alongside so many people, producing this exhibition, learning about the power community. And especially this idea again of international, multi-issue, interdisciplinary, and also the intersection of technology and art. It's such a strong combination when you bring all of these things together. And it's important that I tell you about all that before I go into the rest, because I'm going to circle back to it. But first, let me tell you about what happened to me next personally. Um, after this exhibition, I went on making artworks and I worked as a programmer. And a few years later, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is a chronic condition for those of you that you know about it. If you go to the next slide, please. I made this artwork um, in response to that. It reads blood sugar in real time, and it visualizes my psychological responses to these numbers that are coming from my body. Um, the, there's an implant that you can wear that pulls data from your fatty tissues and it estimates your blood sugar. And I was streaming these numbers over the internet for processing. And this real-time visualizations are like my personal response to what those numbers mean to me, how I, how I imagine what's happening inside my body at any given moment. So it's very deeply personal. It had a very big impact on my life. Um, but you know, other things were happening too. So if you go to the next slide, so I have this chronic health condition, but at the same time, I'm increasingly aware of and active in the climate crisis. Um, I've started to realize just how fundamental and just how all encompassing of a problem the climate crisis really is. It just touches everything. And I'm, I'm seeing that more and more. Um, you know, if all the world is a stage, right? You know, that's saying then all the human drama is what's playing out on top of that stage. Then the climate crisis is like the stage itself sinking into the ground. And so I started to realize that with something so immense, something so dramatic, something so big and hard to get your hands around, it's really important to figure out where you have leverage. And the biggest leverage I had to impact this problem for the better is connecting with the communities and the people that I know, and especially the art and technology communities. So if we move to the next slide, um, one of the things that I did is I created this artwork called Emergency Room. This is at Harvest Works, the exhibition in, um, in New York. And it's an art and tech response to the climate crisis. It looks at planetary effects. It looks at community events and solutions, but it does it all using a personal emergency framing. When you're walking around in that room, there's this constant beeping sound, like a heart rate monitor. There's a breathing, there's a slow breathing to remind you of the personal nature of it all. But you can also hear the sounds of crowds chanting at activist uh, events. You can hear the sound of huge ice slabs carving off, they call it, you know, breaking off and melting into the sea. You can sound, hear the sound of people telling stories and who, who have been involved in storms and extreme weather events. But all the time there's this beep, beep, 
and you're just reminded it brings you back to the, the the global scale of everything that's happening it brings you back to the personal scale because it's it is an emergency right and it's very very similar in my mind to a health a personal health emergency um so on the one minute you know i guess diabetes really brought me here on, on one minute i'm hearing this I'm dealing with this health condition and I have doctors telling me that I need to make these major lifestyle changes and to be on this medication, to take injections, to, to, to take insulin. And they tell me that the, the, the big picture situation I'm dealing with is that the longer that I wait to start, the harder the treatment will become. And the longer that I wait to start, the more urgent the treatment will become. The damage accumulates and it accelerates. And at the same time, I'm hearing that's exactly what the scientific community is saying about the climate crisis, right? But this time it's not just about me, it's about all of human civilization. It's, it's urgent, right? And what I realized is that we've largely, you know, in my personal life, I can do these things, I can take this on board, but as a, as a civilization, we've largely ignored these experts. We haven't been taking our insulin shots, if you like. And most of that time that we had laid out has expired and the need for change now is just incredibly urgent. And it's just not widely appreciated enough in general discourse, how incredibly urgent the climate crisis is. Imagine if it was someone that you care about and you know about, if it's a family member and they're ignoring the doctor's urgent warnings. So I knew I had to do more to bring people together. And that's what you have the power to do right now is to come together as one community. You know, it's often said that the most important thing that we can do right now on climate is to come together. Don't be an individual anymore. No one person has all the skills and all the backgrounds. Some have a little, some have a lot. We all have different kinds of backgrounds. But this program would be fantastic. And all these other partners is for us to collaborate and to use our energy and to confront the climate crisis as a community together. So if you go on to the next slide, um, all the work I've done since then has been very community driven. I co-founded an initiative called climateaction.tech. It's a global community with thousands of tech sector workers who work and meet on the climate crisis at all levels. Everyone's volunteers. Um, it's not sanctioned by it's not driven by a, a company it's it's a volunteers workers from across the tech sector coming together um, they'll be involved they'll be available for people who take part in this program helping to learn helping to support us and and mentor and if we go to the, the next slide um, with dr ellen Pullman, who you'll also meet if you're part of this program uh, i co-founded uh, thoughtworks arts which investigates serious issues connecting tech and social causes including climate crisis um, and other social causes. And it's part of ThoughtWorks. So ThoughtWorks Arts is like a, a sponsored part of ThoughtWorks, which is a major global tech consultancy. They have thousands of people, employees, huge community of global experts who know a lot about tech, very deep tech experts. So if you're feeling unsure that you alone have the right background, then I would encourage you to apply. Let's find out. Um, what happens when we mix everybody together into teams. That's where the power lies. Um, you know, both Climate Action Tech and ThoughtWorks Arts have incubated projects which won pre Ars Electronica awards this year. Um, there was the award of distinction that went to Rashin Fahandej for her father's lullaby. ThoughtWorks Arts was an incubating partner on that. And there was the award for digital humanity that went to Climate Action Tech for Brunch Magazine. Now, both of these happened this year. So this external um like attention that we're getting just helps to reaffirm this idea of the power of community to make waves it's all about community and so I'll, i'm just i'll just wrap up here but i'll just say this which is that with archana and Kamya, kim peng ellen these other partners that are here to help you move forward i really think that this is a strong powerful opportunity and if you apply and work with teams here you're really in exactly the right hands so with that, I'll hand back over to Kamia. Thank you. So thank you so much, Andy, for that. And throwing in the Jaga reference was absolutely great because it really sets visually the uh, ethos that one is trying to achieve in an online space. So thanks for that one. And Jaga is something is the mother organization of Be Fantastic. So 
Thanks for that shout out. Um, just a quick aside while we're talking. About I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Pardon my city. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we have one thing for you to put up, put into the chat. Tell us one tip or trick that helps you focus during online sessions. We're just doing this as a fun crowdsourcing idea generation exercise. We're 76 people in the room. Um, we're, we tend to get distracted. We have our you know chat rooms and emails on on the side. What keeps you focused? or are we becoming multitaskers? So just let's crowd that chat room and share with each other some tips and tricks. And Kartika, we can move to the next one. And the next. One more. So while that chat function is getting filled up, um, what is Be Fantastic Together? Uh, we are imagining it as an online fellowship that brings together people with the ethos that Andy has so beautifully described to explore technology and art for the climate crisis. The goals of the fellowship really are to bring all these weird and wonderful people into the room and have all of us critically and creatively engage with digital technologies. And in this version, the focus will be a lot on AI and ML. Um, the idea that international collaborations not only extend personal networks, but also the possibilities of climate conversation. So we're really looking forward to having a rich cohort of people from everywhere that can contribute to these conversations, the climate crisis being a, a global problem. Um, we're looking forward to seeing the innovation that emerges from people coming together and having fun together and, um, and people from various backgrounds as well. And ultimately to amplify the message through showcasing our experiments, through having dialogue sessions such as this one, uh, and also showcasing our process. It's a messy process. It's not, uh, we very often tend to showcase just the final clean image or product and showcasing the process as well for to have more people join into the conversation is something that we hold dear. Um, who can apply? The next one. So we are looking forward to having a real hearty mix of people, creators, artists, designers, makers, architects, uh, urban planners, interested in understanding what is AI and ML all about, but beyond of AI and ML, how do we use this and what can happen with it? Uh, people with technology backgrounds who would really like to hang out in a creative space for a change and offer their skills and expertise to making really interesting prototypes emerge. Climate champions, climate enthusiasts, people passionate about this subject who may or may not have either a creative, you know, uh, a deep creative side or intense technology in their back pockets. We welcome you too because we think there is a place for you to play in these groups in shaping the projects that emerge. And basically anybody with an experimental mindset with the time and space and desire to engage and commit to hanging out with people from across borders of geography and disciplines and would really like to make something emerge. So that's really who we're looking for. And the next one. So quickly, very quickly, the structure of the fellowship. We have something we've titled the Primer Series within the CoLab, Collaborative Online Space. We'll discuss the history and the kind of technological understanding behind AI and ML. We'll explore some really fun tools for art making. We'll really engage the reason we are uh, 
calling it a fellowship, even though it's online, even though fellowships haven't moved online just yet, is because we really want to invest in people getting to know each other and making those strong connections. Um, we want to unpack in this togetherness the idea of climate in various aspects. And we'll document the work that we do and hopefully come together in smaller groups and create proposals that are then pitched for the master's, collab master's session. The collab master's session takes place in September. And this is a deeper dive. It's not as happy and exciting. It, I mean, I hope it's as happy, but it hopefully is a little bit more intense in its process and its practice because we have some amazing mentors who've jumped on board to work with the groups that get selected, the projects that get selected. And really the mentors we're hoping will steer projects towards a, a close to final prototype that we're proud to showcase and exhibit with. Um, so, and this idea that you would work with each other, learn from each other, peer review, and ex explain or expose the work to audiences who can uh, then take it in. Dialogues like this to support critical engagement and a showcase to global audiences for them to interact and understand and see the work that emerges. So in a nutshell, that is the way we thought through this program. It has a couple of layers. Um, we can go on to the next one. A quick one about time commitments. The primer is 18 hours of online synchronous time, two hours each, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, over three weeks. So it's 18 hours of online time over three weeks. And hopefully at least 18 hours of self-work um, because you would get video lectures and exercises to have fun with before you enter that synchronous space. The master session, we've asked for 10 hours of time with master mentors that each group will have. Uh, and about four to six hours with the larger cohort. So like a, a, a launch event, a finale event, and kind of a midpoint hangout. And based on the proposals that come to bear, each group will need to put in a little bit of time to formulate that. It's hard for us to gauge how much time that will be, but please be prepared to put in some time because we'd really like showcase worthy um, work to emerge. Dialogue sessions, we have six dialogue sessions. This is the first one. Um, and it's, a, it's planned as a two hour session once every month up till December and one showcase in November. So that's kind of the rough layout of time commitments. And how would we overlay climate in, in this world of technology and art that we are learning? Of course, we're taking in climate champions to influence the conversation within the rooms. We have provocators to help us think through, provoke us into thought and action in the primer session. We have dialogue panels to ground our work in deeper conversation. And of course, fellows will hopefully examine some of these aspects of the climate crisis to make proposals richer and um, responding to this. So that in a really quick nutshell is the idea of this fellowship. I know all of you have questions. Please grab those questions. Put it in the chat if you feel it's going to run away from you, write it down. After we speak with Thomas, Naeli, and um, Ambika, we will have at least half an hour to take your questions, uh, if not more. So just another quick chat exercise. Tell us a tip we should adopt to make our online sessions feel better. And with that, I will bring Thomas, Ambika, and Nayeli on uh, to show us some of the work that they've been doing. So, hello. Um, we are here to present our ongoing research. Our project is called Not a Conversation, uh, which we collaboratively developed during the first iteration of the Be Fantastic Collab Fellowship. Um, wait, Many sorry, slides. I think we need the slide first. There it is. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so 
Also, many thanks to Pamia, to Arcana, and the whole team for the invitation and the opportunity to present our work again. Can we go to the um, next one? Okay, so my name is Nayeli. Uh, yeah, my name is Nayeli, and I'm an artist and designer based in Berlin. Uh, I work in the field of textiles, uh, digital fabric fabrication, and 3D representations. And I am founder of a space and art collective in Berlin called Lacuna Lab. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Thomas. I'm a Berlin-based artist as well, and um, yeah, I'm a media artist working on the intersection of installation, uh, intersection of art, science, and technology. And I'm a co-founder of Lacuna Lab as well, and um, the founder of the Space Art Initiative Spa. Hi, I'm Ambika. Uh, I'm I live in Udaipur, uh, that is in India, and I co-run a creative tech and museum strategy firm. And I'm also co-instigator of Draft, which is a small festival and lab on computation and literature. Uh, I've been exploring coding as a form of self-care and learning. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so let's start with a short video that explains the idea a bit about another conversation saying give some impressions. So can we start the video? In this sculpture, we are working uh, with artificial intelligence. We are using these technologies such as uh, GPT-3 to generate some answers to questions we posed about what is the relation between uh, creative activities and how it could be impacted by artificial intelligence. So because Thomas and myself are based in Berlin, uh, we were able to test the prototype and at the same time we were working online uh, with Ambika. So this was uh, kind of like the, yeah, the prototype of an AI based sculpture that is um, using um, Kipur, which is a system that the um, uh, indigenous people used to um, communicate and um, store information in knots. And we built like a knot based sculpture and every knot is an embedded question that can be um, decoded by the AI. The AI generates an answer to that question. Yeah, next slide, please. <clears throat> the next slide, please. So um, now we would like to show you what we actually achieved uh, during the CoLab Fellowship back in October 2020. Apart from taking part in some very enriching learning experiences by the mentored program, we came up with our own project at Year From Scratch through combining our artistic interests, uh, individual skills and knowledge in a way that felt meaningful to all three of us, which I think was really key. Next slide, please. For the fellowship's limited time, we developed a virtual prototype of the sculpture accessible on the web. Um, and you can still find it on our project's website, which you've seen before already, if you want to have a look yourself. Next slide. Uh, we've used uh, uh, Google's Teachable Machines image classification systems to train uh, the different knots of the sculpture. Uh, this was a really easy tool for us to uh, use, and it, it proved to be really helpful even in the further iterations of the project. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so this data set was then uh, used in a companion app, uh, which you saw in the video as well, and it responded to the questions with uh, answers that uh, GPT-3 uh, would generate. However, because the fellowship had limited access to GPT-3, we used a pre-processed uh, set of answers uh, that came up on the uh, prototype app. The fellowship's facilitator, Hassan, was also able to give us really practical solutions to use AI tools to our advantage as, uh, you know, not being, uh, you know, hardcore technology people or uh, from the development field. Next slide, please. Yeah, we were then able to continue our efforts uh, in February this year 
and showcased the project at Lacuna Labs Scattered Partners event series for Vorspiel Transmediale and CTM, which is an art and digital culture festival in Berlin, Germany here that like happens every year and Lacuna Lab takes also part in it very often. Uh, next slide, please. So also for the production of the physical prototype, we use uh, Blender, which is an open source software and fabricated multiple pieces on a 3D printer, which later we assemble and coated by hand. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks to the support by Be Fantastic and Dara Network, um, this time we had full access to GPT-3, which allowed us to use real-time generated answers in the physical prototype, as well as in the second iteration of the digital prototype that was launched in parallel. So the answers were then saved and stored in a database that we are using for continued research. And you can have a look at it on our project's website uh, following the link shown here. Next slide, please. Uh, so also uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic restrictions and without the possibility of hosting a physical exhibition at Lacuna Lab, we video recorded the prototype. And with this, we share it with the audience. With the collected material so far, we are aiming to continue the project in the future. Uh, the next step is to scale up the installation to create an even more immersive experience that the audience can walk through and contemplate on the relationships between AI, creativity, and labor. For this, we hope to see you again on this journey. Mika? I always end up doing this, sorry. Uh, this fellowship not just allowed us to explore uh, art and AI, uh, but also gave us a very positive space to meet other practitioners from very diverse uh, backgrounds and experiences. Of course, you can see that three of us are from very, very different practices. Uh, so thanks again for this opportunity, not, not just the fellowship, but also to like present today. We've learned a lot. We've gained a lot of insight on AI tech and uh, particularly how to apply it to our own practices. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have and reflect on this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks to all our speakers and thanks to all of you in the audience who have held your um, speaking time. Now is your time. We will open it up. Uh, I urge for people who have questions for our panelists which is Andy's work, Kian Pen's work, and now not a conversation. So please address any questions that you have for these people first. Questions about the fellowship itself, we'll take in about 10 or 15 minutes. So please feel free to unmute yourself. This is the dialogue. We'd love to hear from you uh, and start the conversation. I maybe we can stop sharing screen um, just so that we can see people's faces. Perfect. So if I, anybody, I, yeah, I had uh, posted a question. If any of the panelists wants to answer that, it'll be great. So is this about AI, ML technology, and extraction? Of yes. yes, since all such technology, since all such technology depends on mining, extraction, and devastation of land and water, how is it sustainable? And their thoughts, you know, your thoughts as well. Hi, right, I'll take that one. Um, Samurai, I saw you a question in the chat, and I, I just think, first of all, thank you for asking that question because it's an incredibly important question, right? I think that. Um, this is one of the reasons that climateaction.tech was formed. And one of the things that animates that whole program is they, they have to, these are all climateaction.tech people are workers in the tech sector, meaning they are all at, in one moment contributing to uh, commercial activities that use energy, produce emissions, and you know achieve business goals and so on. And, and on the other hand, they have skills and knowledge that they want to apply as experts in the world. And on the other hand, they're aware of the emissions profiles of these companies. And so I think that like what I learned 
by interacting with members of that community is this idea of how do you navigate that towards a positive place and i think that the um the important thing to remember is what's the goal what's the like overarching goal i think that it if you ask that question about well what about our own emissions profiles and our own impact on the environment and on the world if you ask that question the right way you can get to po really positive outcomes and you can make strides in the world there have been some great advances in the tech industry uh in terms of moving towards greener platforms but nowhere near enough so on the bigger goal question we're still working on it but in the how do you produce positive energy from it um it, it's uh so you have to un i think if you ask that question the wrong way you can end up debilitating yourself you say well hold on a second i just switched on my light and i'm pretty sure 80 percent of the energy that powers that light comes from fossil fuel sources so one way or the other whatever um activity you undertake in this space, you will be using energy. Um, you will be causing emissions unless you happen to have built some kind of off-grid perfect society version of what you hope for everyone to achieve. Um, and if you allow that to debilitate you, if you allow that to be your animating and driving force, you know, it, it can stunt you before you start. So I think that the key question is, if we want to get to a place where all society, whether that's starting with our more tangible, achievable local communities and working upwards, whether that's lobbying politicians, whether that's um, building support for you know, uh, commercial entities to make changes and so on. If we wanna get to the place where all society draws down emissions, then we have to think about what are the trade-offs between the energy we want to use today, the emissions profiles that exist today, and how we want to spend those to enable to get to um, the place we want to get to. You know, I guess I guess a similar analogy is when environmental activists fly on planes to go to conferences to talk to audiences. There's an emissions profile there, and it's you can't diminish it. It's huge. Like the emissions profile of aviation is huge. The emissions profile of the tech industry, of machine learning algorithms, and so on, is huge. The question is if we're 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 only using those at a small scale that's not an excuse but the question is can we use these opportunities to make noise and to get draw more attention to the problems and to illustrate and research solutions that can then be implemented for a successful outcome that's really the question so i think that none of what i've said excuses anything but what we want to avoid is for it to debilitate anyone we need to incorporate that question into what we're doing, we need to think about. We there very well may be teams in this process who focus specifically on that. What's the emissions profile of this piece of tech, and how can we make that more visually accessible so that people are aware of it as they act? But I, I think it's really important that we harness that very important question productively and channel it towards positive energy and don't let it debilitate us because we have the opportunity to help change and set narratives. I understand that that is not a good answer. It's not a complete answer, but it's the best answer we have. And I think we need to leverage it in my, this is my opinion, you know, like I think we need to leverage the nuance of that situation and draw it towards the most positive outcomes we possibly can. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think to can jump I ask? on that. Yes, sorry, go ahead. I'm already working with the scrap. My point is there's a lot of plastic scrap available I wanted to create more installation to help all those truck pickers who is picking them up and use as maximum the plastic we uh, use with the plastic without uh, putting a lot of energy in it. Generally, what, who is doing the recycle process, they are doing so much of energy to recycle it. So I think there's no concept of utilizing things. That is the idea. So this technology process is allowing me to create a project and work with the big installation and create awareness and involve these rug pickers to work with.
Great. So I think you were, you were offering that as a way that you are using technology to create awareness. Yeah. Is that what you're saying, Gopal? Yeah, because no, I'm doing the art project as a public art installation to create awareness. Okay. Already coexistence is the idea because development needs so many things. So you cannot stop everything, what is harming actually, but what we can search out the ways you how we can collaborate in between. And plastic is the biggest problem in general right now. And people, all kind of areas, including rural to urban and educated to non-educated, throw that plastic in a soil. So can we create a project with them and create an actual installation and place it somewhere as a public art so people can see and that can then remind them every day, not just to create in a video and uh, stopping it. Sure. Kapil, I think like just to, you know, I think- Maybe it's, I'm over ambitious, but I'm asking. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just think that like what, what's being said is that like these, um, these things are happening whether we intervene or not. So if, if we, we have the opportunity, we can either run away from it or we can run towards it. And running towards it may not be right or perfect, but it, it's where the opportunity is. And so in, in many ways, it's incumbent upon us to run towards these things, to shine a light on them. And the best way to do that is to interact and engage with them. So yeah, that, that's my interpretation of what I'm hearing. Yes, yeah, same. I also want the same interaction between the people. They can see the material. They can see what is they are doing every day. Yeah, and we do hope that that uh, also manifests from a fellowship like this, where we do convene online, think through ideas, manifest it, and then make it happen in real, much like Not A Conversation did. So yeah, thank you, Gopal. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is to Andrew. I was interested in knowing that when you did the diabetes project, the visualization, well, how was it conceived? Uh, you mentioned, the, was it completely computer visualization or did you have a feed towards it? How was that? The visualization is layers of, actually it's scanned textures of, um, of, uh, of rocks and just elements from outside, like dirt, broken glass, things I found in the, in the yard. And this is part of my practice at the time was, was I was layering lots of uh, textures, putting them through color filters and you, you get these really rich results. So I have like a whole back catalog of like sketches that I produced that way. And um, so what I, and then, so there was a data feed coming from an implant on my body. I'm not going to show you, I have one, I'm wearing one right now. And it sends data to um, real-time data feed. Now I use this for medical purposes anyway, but yes. I was working with open source communities. I was able to tap it and feed it into a visualization, which would then display. I used again. to have one data feed too. That's how yeah. I do. <laughs> so it was, so, so that's an example of like, you know, shining a light on how to think about a subject space by using technology to um, connect it to something that like to connect something that's less tangible and occurs mostly in people with diabetes minds and help people to visualize the, how, how that manifests, you know, in feelings terms. Thank you. I think there was one question for not a conversation about why not. What is the significance of not? I think Nayeli would be best to answer that question. Uh, so we, um, I started a, a research on communication through ancient artifacts. And in this case, I found the, the many artifacts, but I was very attracted by the case of the quipus. Uh, the quipus are and uh, where Andean artifacts uh, the Andean region in, in mostly in Peru, uh, the Inca people communicated through knots, which were um, tied cords. And these knots represented, it is said that represented numbers or even narrative. 
So from this uh, research, I started to, to work with other kind of nodes that are mathematical nodes, uh, trying to build or to create a, a story on how to communicate through these nodes. So that, that was my, 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 my work previous to the fellowship. Then I met Ambika and Thomas and we started um, another journey, but also using the nodes as a communication medium. I yeah. Yes, we felt actually that they are like really ideal also because it's it's this kind of like encryption decryption uh, um, thing that uh, was used a hundred years back already in this um, uh, specific uh, way, and then we thought this is actually what we can like do digitally as well, and it felt really natural to go with knots for that. Yeah, and I think this is a classic example of how uh, what you do in your fellowship is informed by your previous practices. It's it's an extension of what you're doing already. You know, we don't expect you to come in and start off afresh, but really bring your backgrounds into the space. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I do realize we have sorry, fifteen minutes to go. Uh, I can see in the chat, and maybe these are questions in the room as well, uh, about a little bit more about the fellowship itself. Um, a couple of the questions that are coming is asking about team formation and groups. How do groups get formed? What is the dynamics of that? Uh, so I think uh, without going into too much detail, it's safe to say that the primer series is intended and structured in a way that you will get to meet a lot of people in the room in smaller groups and understand each other's practices. Um, and we are going to be instituting in this version ways in which groups can come together. So people with ideas pitch, people with skills and who want to kind of craft and make ideas happen can formulate groups based on the synergies in the room. So <clears throat> this is different from the last time that we did it, but uh, we really would like for groups to form from that space of self-motivation and excitement to garner around a certain subject. So that is um, how groups will be formed. There's another question about how many of these groups will go on to being in the master space. We are hoping at least half of the room will go, if not more. It really depends on how many people apply, how many people come in. Um, we can take up to 30 people in the master's session. Um, so it, it kind of depends on how many people come in, want to hang out, convene into groups. And we will try our best to do whatever it takes to support that process to get you into that mastered mentored space. Um, I also see some questions about how much of AI or ML do we need to know? The answer to that is not much. It's okay. If, even if you're a technologist who doesn't know enough of AI and uh, ML, please come on in because the primer series is intended for you to play with that and get a feel for it. Um, how deep you go into it after you got a feel for it is really in your own hands. But the idea is to get everybody an easy foot in the door to play together. Um, anybody else who has, I mean, I, there are a few more questions, but I just don't want to keep rambling on. So if there are other, pressing fellowship related thoughts in the room, could you please unmute yourself and ask your questions? There was a question from Valia Payella, if that, if that person is there. Uh, I'm not sure if they're there, but the question was, uh, please let me know if the climate crisis is the only topic that we have to work on uh, they're investigating fake news as well. Can they bring this topic to the fellowship study as well? Hmm. Andy, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> well, uh, um, so the 
this, so the focus of what we're doing is climate crisis. It, and that is an intersectional issue by its very nature. I mean, fake news plays in hugely to the climate crisis. So uh, no, you can't come and do a fake news project that is entirely unrelated to the climate crisis, but I think you'd struggle to find an issue that you care about that doesn't connect to the climate crisis. So if you're interested in figuring out what those connections are, if you have ideas about how those connections could manifest and you want to bring those to teams, that's what this is all about. So you can apply on that basis. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Um, sorry, I'm Jill Scott. I'm coming in from Switzerland. Um, the question I have, of course, after years and years of working in art and science and technology, is the question about um, actual collaborations with scientists, particularly environmental scientists, and the data that they're actually generating seems to be that it's sadly lacking the potentials of sonification and visualization. So the question is, what could we start an initiative with scientists, in fact, that would then, you know, ask younger people to join it? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, as provocators, we are talking to some of these kinds of people, including Future Cities Lab and folks mm -hmm. who are in the thick of creating and generating that kind of academic data. Mm -hmm. And how can we, how can they become pro provocators, pass on some of what they are beginning to understand into this room that creates um, experiences, artistic experiences out of it. So yes, the answer, simple answers, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, that sounds like a great proposition, uh, you know, for something for one of the teams to focus on. And we, you, I think you had a question about where are the, where are those people in the room? Well, we have like, between us, we have very wide networks and we, there are people with those skills and backgrounds that we could bring in. Typically, they're very um, hard to, you know, they, they're very time poor. But uh, if we have propositions that touch on subject areas where we can bring in domain experts to support projects, um, then it's a lot easier to take those propositions to those domain experts and bring them in. So that's definitely a possibility. Jay Chandran, hello. Fellow oh, hello. Hi, good afternoon from Bangalore. Yes. Um, um, you know, I'm a choreographer and um, uh, uh, kind of for directing a center for movement art, primarily working in the realm of uh, uh, contemporary dance. Um, and so we are interested in the digital technology. So I was just uh, wondering whether um, AI, not maybe not too much about ML, but, but VR, are you, are you engaged with uh, that kind of activities where um, physical movements, gestures, um, or uh, interactive um, scenography, these kind of things are, are that of in interest or concern to you? Yes, in terms of the kinds of artists that we had in the room, even in the previous round, we did have movement artists in the room who were beginning to understand this technology to use within their own practice. So a lot of what will be offered here can be adapted to various different art forms. We had uh, sonic artists, we had movement artists, we had visual artists, we had installational artists. So we did have various kinds of art making practices that can begin to play with these um, technologies. Okay. This will be of interest to me if that is the case, because uh, we are uh, planning to have um, a kind of um, network based um, festival events in December, January, February. I mean, we are hoping. Mm -hmm. subject to funding of course and right. if that happens then we will be interested to look at that possibility and if there is some kind of group forming i would like to be in, informed of that that i will be interested to explore that sure so uh, yeah we can set up some time and have a chat uh, offline yeah. okay. thanks thank you so much may i ask another question Sure, Samrat. Okay, so the nature of my question is not uh, supposed to be provocative or offensive, but having done like three, four years of, let's say, work and research, me being an artist myself, um, we, I keep coming back to the fact that 
is faith in technology like how faith was a couple of centuries ago about other structures which existed in society which are not as powerful anymore yeah, let's say it could be religion it could be patriarchy though even patriarchy is quite 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 uh, prevalent in, in india and the rest of the world i mean like is technology like the faith in technology something that is like faith in general you know Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I think discussions in the previous rooms have acknowledged both sides of this conversation. Um, we are definitely more optimistic in the way we are playing with things than pessimistic. And to go back to Andy's point of how can we use it and use it well, I think that's that's the the way we would go about it. Uh, do we go in blind feeling so rosy-eyed about the technology we're using? Probably not, right? So it, there is a lot of discussion. AI and ML itself is high computational uh, energy consuming practices, right? So we do need to talk about these things as we get into it. Um, but yeah, I think that would be my answer, but Andy and Kian Peng, any Talks yeah, Thomas. You no, know, I think I think that your question summarizes is very philosophical, and I think that if you ask every participant in this program, you will get a different answer when they've had a little time to digest it and reflect on it. Um, I don't think that we're presenting faith in technology as a prerequisite. In fact, one of the key things we are doing as part of this is to critique technology, and so you know, in a way, it's a good thing to ask because, you know. We want people to be excited and to be active and to feel engaged and, and able to engage with technology. We're bringing in a lot of people who, ne who don't work with technology. Why are we doing that? Because technology suffers from an in-crowd thinking where there's a, you know, a little pinball of faith dotting around back and forth and in many ways is destabilizing societies. Right, it's playing an active role in destabilizing societies. That's huge. We can't address all of that in this fellowship, but what we can do is to lower the barrier to entry, bring in people who have outside perspectives, people who may may or may not have collaborated with technologists before, and enable them, give them the ability to ask these difficult and critical questions in teams with people who know these these technology practices. Like with the programs I mentioned earlier, climate action tech and ThoughtWorks Arts, that's exactly what we do all of the time. I've heard some people describe it as how do you bring the humanities into the tech world to help critique it? Well, that's what we're doing. That's what that's the reason we want artists to collaborate with technologists, um, not to flag wave for technology, but to critique it and, and to critique it from an outside perspective. And some of the projects that we end up producing do exactly that and do a very effective job of drawing audiences around it. Um, so again, none of these, you know, you ask, if you ask a big question like that, none of the answers are ever going to be completely satisfying, but that's the way we think about it. Or at least that's how I think about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, I actually wanted to know where are we going to get all the data from? Because it looks like there's fluctuating data, which we need to keep getting to create any kind of art piece or whatever it is. So. Who's going to be giving us that data? Um, I assume, and Andy, I'll let you take this as well. I, I assume it will depend on the aspect that you're most interested in. So we, between the panelists and the provocators uh, and our networks, if, yeah, uh, we could try to see if that's something either you could bring in from your networks as well, or if that's really something that's needed to be work worked with, how we can support it. Yeah, I, I think yes. there are many open source data platforms out there, like data.world or um, you know, there are vernacular data uh, platforms, like in Singapore, we have uh, data.gov. So there are many such open source platforms. And, and of course, there's also the option of working with researchers who are really, you know, in, in possession of a huge data set. Um, so these are all possibilities, but I think it really depends on your interest. Uh, it, you might even decide that, hey, you know, I want to have 
a personalized data collection. Maybe you want to make a simple sensor that collects data. So these are all possibilities that we can work with. But I think it depends on what you're personally interested in. Yeah, I okay. also just Thank wanted you. to add to this quickly because I think um, from like the perspective of going through the fellowship once already, right? Um, there's also a lot of stuff happening during the fellowship, right? A lot of exchange, knowledge, knowledge exchange, um, sharing links and resources. And I mean, this is like usually also like when everybody brings in their interest, then, you know, um, the a certain dynamic uh, comes up and um, it will just like automatically find you maybe. So I wouldn't worry so much about it. Okay, and what about like the groups? Are you responsible for grouping us or like do we create our own groups? So we will have a series of um, interactions that will help you understand who else is in the group. But the idea is that participants, fellows form their own groups based on ideas, skills, uh, interest, things like that. So the idea is that you will form your own group. But there is a process that we are beginning to design that we will deliver to help you do that. So you're not on your own. We, the fellowship is supporting that process. Uh, I just interject because I always do this with Kamya and she knows this through the fellowship. But I would just say that please don't fear applying because once you do that and once you're part of the group, you will immediately understand why you, you've kind of you know, like you've come into this space and what's going to happen after that. I'll uh, give just my example. I was not a practicing artist or, or a creative uh, sort of creative practitioner before this fellowship. I was very much trying experiments in a corner of the world uh, with very few people whom I would share it with. And it was through the fellowship, I was able to get a sense of validation of, okay, this, this is where my practice can lie. And uh, not just, okay, the three of us, Naidi, Thomas, and I have developed a great bond and you know they really helped me understand what I can do with it. But the general interactions with the group are really rich. And uh, that kind of face-to-face uh, -face conversations that they've been able to give us through small groups or through the larger uh, facilitators, through conversations with the mentors have been very enriching. And, and, uh, and it will address many of these smaller questions that that even I had in my mind when I had applied that okay how will they choose the groups how will you know can I pick this person can I not pick this person and, and that time we didn't choose uh, the team chose for us but I couldn't have chosen it better than the way they did because it gave me a right balance of the kind of people I would have liked to work with so I think it's just like you have to you have to give faith to the pro program and I would say the same to Samrat as well that uh, there will be people who will come with a lot of critical thought because the people who are coming into the fellowship are coming in with their own knowledge and experience. So they are adding to the fellowship. It's not just, you know, going to be like a Coursera uh, project, you know, where you're just like being thrown with ideas about AI and technology. It's going to be a, a very sort of wide range conversation about technology, not just learning a tool and just like slapping out a, a bunch of, you know, uh, visuals or, or whatever so so don't like don't fear these small questions just jump jump into it and, and just apply <laughs> okay thanks a lot tambika just another small thing so i think a lot of us might be working individuals here so even taking the time off right now was quite tough for me because it's a working day so how are we going to accommodate this alongside our work schedule hmm Yes, you do have to make a little bit of time for it. Uh, oh, can we do weekends? Or, you know, is, is there some schedule like that which we could work with or does it happen on weekdays? Like, how is it going to work? It happens on weekdays. So all of these details are there on the open call in the website, befantastic.in. So if you just jump into the website, a lot of these details are there. Got it, got it. Thank you. Christy, sorry to have your hand up for a while now. Thanks for waiting. Sure, no problem. So. Um, it's actually really wonderful to interact with all of you. So I am a scientist. I'm a professor at ETH of Zurich. And I was, um, yeah, I've always been inspired by the art science movements and sort of been on the periphery as a scientist. Um, so, uh, you know, Andy, in your introduction and in, in your exploration of the climate crisis, you said something that was really important. And this is what I think um, often scientists were good at what we do with the technology and developing technology how to the world or whatever it is, but we're not good at communicating necessarily, right? And so a 
lot of data does just sit on the shelf literally for years or decades and no one no one knows about it and i think you know this point that you know the scientists have been saying stuff for a really long time but we need the transformation right we need everybody talking about it in any way that they possibly can and um so i really applaud this whole thing and i'm really fascinated um and i have a suggestion for the program which is that it would be really great to just reach out to a bunch of scientists and get them actually involved like get a committee or a group or a management committee or something that could be a part of the the program um and i would be happy to generate that 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 vibe or whatever but um uh, jill and i are trying to figure out a way to collaborate she's an artist and i'm a scientist and so we'll, maybe we put something together to propose but but I really think that there's this intersection of, you know, people don't want to look at graphs, you know, and this this other piece in the beginning about um, the former, oh, I'm forgetting her name, about just, you know, translating into music that you can feel data. <laughs> That's amazing, right? And I, I'm, I'm in that same place, you know, and I, my, my question, though, is, um, and I think, Andy, you kind of already said it, so climate crisis is kind of this overarching thing. Um, is there, like, the deep-seatedness of all the other things that are connected to the climate crisis, a real point, and is, can we explore other technologies besides just AI and ML, or is, there, is that the focus? Um. Yeah, Andy. There's a lot of things. Sorry, yeah, yeah. a couple uh, opinions in the question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, basically, so AI and ML is what we have mentorship available for um, because we have some of those skills to offer because they are really there are simple ways that people with and without technical skills can produce rich visuals, and so they're a really good starting point not just visuals, but sonification, you know, other, other kind of media that lends itself to online teaching. But with, that doesn't mean that we're excluding these other technologies. In fact, some of the most impactful projects that I'm aware of um, have nothing to do with AI and ML. And a lot of it's more to do with communication. So I think that AI and ML is helpful, is helpful to help artists and technologists work together and find a common voice. It's also helpful, a helpful way to approach data um, and again, we're doing this on a very small scale and using widely available tools. Um, there are bigger questions when these things go to a larger scale, but to help these participants find a voice and express it quickly, AI and ML is a really good place to start. Um, but th from there, as you saw with Not A Conversation, they start with a 3D graphic on a website and they end up with a physical in-person installation with GPT-2 and uh, camera devices that are feeding. So, so, where it ends up could be all over the map, but but AI and ML is a helpful starting point. Um, Kamya and Archana and the Be Fantastic team have this approach that you've heard described with the primer and the masters. And the primer is more, I guess, formulaic in the, 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 to answer the question about um, time commitments. The primer is like, okay, we're gonna meet on this day at this time and we do our best to make it as very time sensitive, uh, time zone available as possible this place this time you learn you you start to learn about each other as a team at the same time as you're learning about the technologies you um, start to form into subgroups that are focused on particular issues and then propose like we, we'll incubate the process why, whereby you develop and propose projects and then the masters is is where you take those projects and turn them into an initial prototype and that's much more fluid the times can be different depending on the teams we've split into smaller groups we have specific mentors for specific groups and um, the technology the array of technologies that you can start to lean into widens so I think think of AI and ML as a starting point for the online experience and it's a pleasure to meet you Kirsty and thank you for you and Jill for your uh, input here it's fascinating yes and we will reach out to you since you have made the offer Sorry, Malvika, you had your hand up, but it's gone away. We'll talk maybe offline. Akhil, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, hi. So until now, I'm assuming whatever was discussed was pertaining to uh, the Together program. Is the Flyover Company uh, 
different from this because the call seems to be more specific. Yes, yes, that is a different call. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. Uh, would you mind clarifying uh, how it's different? Yeah. Like the things you'll be doing there. Can we just yeah. talk about that offline? Uh, yeah, sure. Email coordinator jaga.in. We'll uh, talk with you more about that. Okay. Thank you. And Malvika, I think you had a question about what can collectives apply? Yeah. Could you just uh, clarify what you meant? Uh, so basically, I'm, uh, I have a collective with a friend in Canada and they're slowly expanding. We were doing this home gallery thing where we were exchanging works from artists from Canada and sending it over to India and having like tiny exhibitions in the house itself. Uh, kind of slowed down during the pandemic. But uh, she also wanted to join this along with me. So is it possible that we both apply as a collective to the project? Sure. Yeah. So the idea, I think, is not to have too many people from one group being part of it. But if you feel like, I mean, each of you have different skill sets, we, we would probably look at you as individuals in the room as well. We're both like contemporary art practitioners and we've been sure. like practicing for about four years now. So it's a large like pool of things that we do. But her and my work is quite uh, going along the similar lines that we from the collective. And I was interested to see how it would go in terms of like technology because we're looking into uh, studying it more as a part of performance art. Uh, so I don't know like what the scope of mediums would be, but we both would like to apply together. Sure, please do. I think I think you should both apply um, because especially the, the primer will you'll be essentially feel a bit more individual and you'll be more mixed in with the group and that's intentional and that's on purpose and that's important but when when it comes to the masters you'll have the opportunity to apply as a collective or to propose as a collective along with other people you've met who can augment your skills and experience um, to to uh, do something together and so the fact that you've already worked together and have a working relationship is is really important so anyway we can't make guarantees but like it sounds as though that's going to work out quite well so i think you should both apply and what kind of uh, content are you looking for within the proposals like should we talk about our practice should we talk about like what we're doing currently what is the base of the proposal you mean right now to apply for the fellowship yes yes okay uh, it it's just a series of things it's your statement of purpose your practice this far where you kind of see your practice going towards and how this fellowship would help you get to that place. So that's kind of the thing. It's all again there on our open call website, befantastic.in. So if you land there, you have all of the questions that um, you need to answer this. Okay. Just everybody, deadline 30th of June. So please get your um, applications into us by then. And I do see a lot of people are popping off. So uh, we will continue these conversations. Our panels, the panelists will stay a little bit longer to take it. But I just wanted to quickly say thank you to everybody who is in the room. And to also say that since all of you have registered with us on for this Zoom link, um, our partner, Dara, we, we will put you on the Dara space. And a lot of these conversations can continue there. It's like a Slack or a WhatsApp group. Um, and we will continue to be in touch with you. So please keep your questions coming, whether it's about the fellowship or about tech and art for the climate crisis in general. We'll keep that going um, as we go along. So I just wanted to do that quick shout out and that quick wrap up. Um, we can continue to take a few more questions as well. Um, so for those who feel like your burning questions haven't been answered, we are here to chat some more. I'd like to ask a question? Yes. Um, since let's say, um, given this conversation and the little I know earlier, um, AI and ML, seems to be like a new future pathway, or let's say call, call it an emerging pathway. Now, um, I had conveyed this to somebody at uh, um, uh, Pro Helvesia 
that I'm writing an article as like a follow up of being a part of this video um, conference, which has right. been uh, like a really good experience is what is then in a nutshell, or if, if there is one, the objective of be fantastic. I mean, like, obviously it's related to technology, arts and uh, climate change. What are, or what is be fantastic uh, trying to achieve over here? Within the fellowship or in general? Well, I'd like to know in general, but if you'd like to answer the fellowship, that's also fine. Okay, so I think we, we come from the premise that um, when technology and art play together, we have new experiences uh, of understanding the world around us. Uh, for me personally, what I saw manifest is that when we ran the festival itself, we marketed our festival to the 18 to 35 year old immigrant in Bangalore who's basically tech savvy. And that's who we thought we're catering to. And instead what happened is we were on MG Road in Bangalore, which is this tourist spot where people from rural Karnataka and beyond in the country have to just walk down that Mahatma Gandhi Road as a tourist thing to do. And so out of the 10,000 people who visited our festival, most of them were not our stereotypical target audience, right? So we had kids who came back all the time who did not get the conceptual components of the art pieces, but the interactivity of this art was so engaging that they came back to be part of this art festival. Uh, we had people who didn't know language, um, you know, so they we had the concept notes in English and Canada, but this went beyond language barriers. You still got something out of interactive tech and art beyond your, you know, the barriers of language. So it just felt like something that was so mass appealing. And um, a lot of people got into the space of, you're inviting people to press buttons and hear and listen and really get into your art object. So that immersivity of, um, tech and art coming together. So that all of these really tell compelling stories and take a viewer into new experiences, take audiences into new ways of engaging with the world around them. So for us, I think that was really exciting. Uh, and when that happened, you can, you can see audiences on the one hand, but then you can also see artists on the other hand getting really excited and stimulated to have these cross-border collaborations happening. So with these two communities in mind, I think that's where we bring to bear more such projects. And it keeps us awake at night, writing proposals and saying, okay, we've got, we've got to do more of this. Thank you. Andy, from your perspective, do you have an answer for Samrat? I think the question was was very much directed at Be Fantastic, but I, I think AD has a raised hand and has had for a while. AD, oh, AD. sorry, I didn't. I'm not. Hello. <laughs> Am I audible? Hi, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, hi. First of all, uh, thank you for this wonderful and informative session. Uh, it was really great to be a part of it. I, I really didn't have the time to formulate the question uh, while listening to all of you, so I'll just try my best. My um, my point is that I understand the the need and the importance of using technology as a means of self expression. But uh, is there any? And I would like to know in this room: is there any interest or uh, to use technology as a means of self reflection uh, to take a step back and see what we are doing as a means of understanding of who we are? And I'll just share a couple of examples that have been um, that I've been wondering about. Uh, first of all, uh, when we call like uh, we have named this the system artificial intelligence. When we call something intelligent, uh, a system that can perform complex mathematical problems and solve them solve them in minutes, but a system that is just learning to crawl and walk. Uh, as we know that, um, you know, something that babies can do easily, a um, robot cannot, but they can do complex uh, 
problem formulations with much ease so what does what does that say about what we think is intelligence what um you know something like that and uh, the other thing another thing that i was wondering about was that there are people who are working on the front lines of technological advancements who are worried that if we if we develop a being that is intelligent uh, it might banish humanity from existence the first thing it will do is punish us for what we have done to the planet so when somebody comes to the front lines and say something like that what i would like to know is what does it say about us in in the collective um, are we worried that we have done something wrong we have pushed our boundaries and we will be sin we have sinned and will be punished on the judgment day where is the space to discuss um like uh, is is the space open to discuss such uh, such ideas that 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 was my question it, it's not a question but just yeah the, the the you know it depends on how that links to climate i mean if you're dealing with climate tech ai ml i mean we're already dealing with a huge expansive space right and so we have to, you know, calls and programs have to be thematized. They have to have boundaries, otherwise they're, they're too broad, right? And, I, and that's one of my concerns is this is already a very broad, but in some sense oh, it's narrow. Sorry, I, just, I may I jump in? So to, to put a boundary around this, so thinking through on these lines, one of the practical uh, concerns that I had was right now everybody is very excited about how much data we can collect and process and make something useful out of it but on the other side my concern is what about the digital footprint that we are leaving behind and to give up a, a visual example of what i'm saying is if you imagine a beach and people walking people walking hello hello am i audible hello uh hello yeah there was a problem with the line i think you can continue go ahead yeah sorry so if you imagine a beach where people are walking down uh the beach and so what happens is the waves washes off their footprints but my concern with the digital space is that who is that we're collecting all of this data but there is no proper guideline or a consensus of on how and when to dispose it off because just remembering all of this data is taking up our resources uh so it's it's like a beach where our footprints will never be washed off it's it's like walking on the moon what uh, what about problems like that we it's lovely that we can do all of these things but uh, uh, in the long term it's it's going to have problems about which should be discussed beforehand. Yeah, I, you know, I got two answers to that. One is that this is the power of art, where you, artists can jump over boundaries, and that has that's one of the things that artists can do so much better than anybody else. So that's one answer. The other answer is that this program has to have a theme, and I think from what you've you've described just there it doesn't link to that theme. Now, it may be that it does, and we need to understand how it does, but but right now it sounds like a different topic for a different seminar for a different fellowship. I hope that helps. Sure, thank you. Okay, so our panelists have been really kind and stayed on much longer than we had expected. And that's really because the conversations in the room have kept us going. So thank you so much, all of you for your time. Um, I do want to thank our panelists and not keep them on too much longer. Um, like I said, we can continue and would really like to continue this conversation on Dara. Uh, we will be sending all of you emails on how to get onto that group. Um, so please keep your questions coming there. If you really need to, uh, to message us, coordinator at jaga.in, please email us and we will be happy to email you back as well. Um, yeah, with that, I need to thank all of you again for coming. I need to thank our funders for, and some of you are in the room. I saw Maureen, Aman, thank you. 
Wendy was here. I'm not sure if you're still here. So thank, thank you all. And I really can't wait to see what's going to unfold on the 30th of June and more. So thanks, Ken Peng. Thanks, Thomas, Ambika, Naeli, Andy, and all, all of you for your amazing questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.